Hello and welcome to GameSack. A year and a half ago, we checked out some obscure 3D platformers. I figured now is as good a time as any to check out some more. Are these any good or were they mostly uncelebrated for a reason? Let's find out. Everyone's favorite video game character is Pac-Man, right? No? Well anyway, here's Pac-Man World from Namco released on the PlayStation in 1999. The scary ghosts have kidnapped Pack Dog, Pack Baby Girl, Dig Dug, Pack Grandpa, Pack Boy, and even Miss Pac Man. This pisses off Pac Man to no end, and he sets out to Ghost Island to retrieve his belongings and get some Pac revenge. You control Pac Man, of course, and basically they attempted to keep true to the way the original game works while taking place in a mostly 3D world. For example, there are ghosts wandering around, and you need to eat power pellets in order to defeat them. Other enemies can be defeated with a butt bounce, though. In fact, the butt bounce is the thing that you'll be using the most. It can help you get to higher places which you can't with a normal jump, and it can also press switches as well as open treasure chests. Like a lot of 3D games back in this time, it can be kind of a collect-a-thon. You need to collect all of the fruit you can. If you come to a doorway that has a picture of a fruit, you can't enter it unless you've already grabbed that fruit. Inside can be anything from another switch, more life, or a letter so you can spell out Pac-Man. There are also items that you can get like this one which turns you into Steel Pac-Man. This way you can sink and easily open underwater treasure chests. You even have a spin dash similar to Sonic so you can have a boost of speed. There are even some platforms that you need to make move using your spin dash. Sometimes when you open a fruit door, you'll find a maze that you can play. This is basically just Pac-Man, polygon style. All you need to do is eat all of the pellets and you're good. But be careful because most of the mazes have diabolical traps. Like this one, which has lasers which randomly turn on and off. <laughs> Oops. Connecting everything together is a hub world, and of course, new levels are unlocked as you finish earlier stages. The levels themselves are huge, and they each have a tiny bit of backtracking if you want to collect everything. In fact, I think the levels might be a bit too big, as some of them seem to drag on a little bit sometimes. Most will have some task that you need to perform to unlock the exit, like blowing up a cage that surrounds it with a cannon in this particular level. But activating the cannon means pressing lots and lots of different switches first. The control can be spotty here and there, and sometimes it's difficult to judge depth, but other than that, it all works fine. Actually, I take that back. The swimming controls could probably use a bit of refining, but they certainly could be worse. It definitely takes some getting used to, though, and thank goodness this game saves after beating each level. The graphics are good with nice color. In fact, I'm surprised Ghost Island is this vibrant and bright. Well, not every place is, I guess. There's also a widescreen mode in this one, which is almost unheard of in this generation of games. It's really not that much wider, but it's still neat that it's here. The sound is, of course, full of familiar Pac-Man sounds, and the music is definitely suitable to the game. And as can be expected, you can play the original arcade Pac-Man right from the title screen. All in all, this game is pretty fun to play, though I found myself wanting to take a short break after every couple of levels since they are so long. In 2002, Namco released Pac-Man World 2 for every available system at the time, and this is the GameCube version. This is a natural evolution to the first game and a welcome improvement in pretty much every way. First off, this is much more of a true 3D game than the original. You're running around in all directions, up, down, left, right, forwards, backwards, and it feels much less like a 2.5D game. Basically, the story is that the scary ghosts have stolen the golden fruit from Pac-Man's tree. Of course, this brings forth a harbinger of doom, and now Pac-Man has to go and get all of the golden fruit back. This game controls so much better than the original, and as a result, it's a lot more fun. Swimming now feels good, and it's actually fun. Most of the gameplay elements remain the same, but there's a lot less button clicking, though it is still here. There's also many more pellets this time around to collect. The same rules apply to the enemies. Most of them you can kill by bouncing on them except for the ghost, which require a power pellet. Instead of matching fruits with doors, you now match them with treasure chests. You can also collect several tokens in each level. You can use these in the arcade, which has several different Pac-Man games to play, but you need to collect enough tokens to unlock each of them. Your spin dash is still here, and you can cancel it at any time by pressing the A button. 
You'll need to do this sometimes, otherwise you might overshoot your target. The target bouncing returns, and it's really fun here since the camera switches angles. Pac-Man looks like he's having so much damn fun bouncing around these things, doesn't he? Mazes are still hidden around in chests for a fun Pac-Man diversion. Certain parts of some stages also play like Pac-Man, but you don't need to eat all of the pellets to clear it, it's just an obstacle to get by. If you want to get all the pellets though, well, more power to you. The graphics are hugely improved, at least for the GameCube version here. Everything moves at 60 frames per second. The higher frame rate definitely makes the depth perception a lot easier to judge. Unfortunately, it doesn't support 480p, but you can force it into that mode like I did here with Swiss. The music is good, but it's also very repetitious. The game's theme plays in most musical selections, and it gets old pretty fast. Still, this is a welcome improvement on the original, and I had lots of fun with it. It is the year 2005, and Namco has released Pac-Man World 3 for most systems, and once again, this is the GameCube version. This one sure is weird. While this game has a lot of the same gameplay features that we know from the first two Pac-Man World titles, this is almost an entirely different beast. This was co-developed by Blitz Games, who are probably most famous for Glover on the Nintendo 64. As a result, this feels very different. There's now a huge emphasis on combat. Pac-Man can now punch his enemies to death. He can still butt bounce in most cases as well. There are even scarier and deadlier ghosts now, and they can be dispatched with a power pellet or two. There's not much of an emphasis on collecting things, but there's still a lot of stuff to grab and be on the lookout for. Instead, this is a more dreadful, serious game where you need to worry about saving the entire world. The time for fun is over, Pac-Man. This is real. It's like the developers wanted to make a Metal Gear Solid or a Prince of Persia style story, but Namco forced them to do Pac-Man instead. I mean, Pac-Man now talks, and he talks a lot. Who dumps a giant busted robot? Who made all this weird junk? Not only that, but he even has a radio buddy. That's right, Pac-Man has a radio buddy. The spectral monsters come from the spectral realm, which is being siphoned by Irwin. I swear the world has gone to hell when even Pac-Man gets a radio, buddy. The game wants you to move around in each area to throw switches and move things around to get to the next part of the level. You've played stuff like this before. It's all dictated by what's going on with the plot. The hidden mazes are still here for you to find, but now they're pretty basic, even compared to the first game. The graphics are pretty dreary and don't have much color or vibrancy at all. Unfortunately, the frame rate is all over the place and it's nowhere near as smooth as the 60 frames per second gameplay of part two. And once again, progressive scan is not supported. There is a widescreen mode, but it crops the top and bottom, so it's pretty half-assed. As for the music, well, it can actually be quite good, but it's definitely not appropriate for Pac-Man. This game would be pretty good if it were a touch less repetitive and it wasn't starring Pac-Man. I don't know who thought this would make for a good Pac-Man game or what they were trying to do with the character, but whatever, it's, it's interesting at least. Wow, I didn't expect to spend the entire first segment talking about friggin' Pac-Man. And I'm also disappointed that they haven't since come out with a Pac-Man first-person shooter with lots of blood, nudity, swearing, and yelling. Yelling like I'm doing right now for absolutely no reason. Oh well, let's check out a game that was an original IP. This is Legend of K on the PlayStation 2 from Capcom. 
There's also a version for the DS and anniversary editions for the PS4, Wii U, as well as the Mac and PC. There are also versions for the PS3, Xbox 360, and the Switch. It's also available for it, wait, I think that's it. <laughs> At least I hope. Maybe this isn't actually obscure, but I've never heard of it back in the day. A few of you suggested I take a look at this game, so I did. For a 3D platformer, this game starts incredibly slow. It takes a good while for it to become interesting. I like to have fun with a game right away when I start playing. Is that really asking too much? Perhaps it is. Anyway, you play as a cat called K. Your people and the bunnies and the pandas and whatnot all used to get along. But then the gorillas and the rats came in and now everything is bad. So remember kids, if they're different from you, they're no good! You start out by running errands like delivering letters back and forth to characters who can't be more than a few hundred feet away from each other. Seriously, why? Who designs these missions? All I want to do is platform and have fun. Anyway, after a few fetch quests and other minor tasks, you start by learning your moves, which itself takes longer than it should. That's because each thing needs to be slowly taught to you. Yeah, I know, I must sound really impatient right now, right? I think tutorials are another one of my video game pet peeves, I guess. Design your game well and you won't need them. About 45 minutes in, you're finally set free, more or less. You still have lots of learning to do in the future. Anyway, basically there's a bunch of hack and slash action and the enemies can seem pretty tough because they block a lot. You'll be fine though as long as you don't let them hit you. Their attacks are usually pretty easy to avoid, at least for the lowly common enemies. Fighting isn't something that's constantly happening though. There's lots of platforming, but I feel it could be better. For example, right here there's a platform to your left that you need to get to, but you'd never know it was there unless you try to circle the camera around. And I say try because it doesn't always cooperate. But at least you can control it somewhat with the right analog stick. Mostly, it's pretty fun moving throughout each area. There's stuff to collect as you'd expect, as well as tricky things to do, like your high jump. Normally, you can double jump, but if you do a somersault first, then you can jump higher with a single jump. What kinda sucks is that you need to first crouch by pressing circle and then press X to jump. It's not hugely complicated or anything, it's just kind of odd. This can also be combined with an attack to perform a strong downward thrust, but it's pretty slow. And then they're zipping around with the zongs. These are wooden things which contain demon souls or some such thing. You have to destroy them with a square button, then quickly press triangle to zip to the next one, then quickly press square again to destroy that one, then press triangle again, and you get the idea. It honestly doesn't sound bad when I'm describing it, but trust me, it feels slightly wonky. Still though, it's easy enough to do. Then there are the wild boar writing sequences. These are pretty fun. You need to keep grabbing acorns to stay alive and chili peppers make you run really fast. If you smash into anything and fall off, then you can start over from the beginning. Every character in this game is voiced. Horribly! Seriously, it's like the developers got their kids and their neighbors to do everything here. It's bad. I lost three of my pumpkins. If I can't find them soon, I'll need some help getting them back. They also feel the need to tell you the most trivial things. Hey, my friend, over here. Hey, what's up? Do you see that button over there guarded by rats? Sure. Press it! Okay, but first I gotta knock off those rats. Yeah, I would've never figured that out, thanks. Graphically, the game is decent. There's no progressive scan mode available, and that's not unusual for a PlayStation 2 game. The music is pretty good in most areas. And aside from the constant voices, the sound design is overall good. Still, I never became interested in any of these characters. This game is focusing a lot on its story, so interesting characters are a must for something like that. This isn't a horrible game by any means, it just can feel very slow paced. This is Jersey Devil on the PlayStation, which was published by Sony themselves and developed by Behavior. Though on the intro screen, Behavior stylizes their name like this. Why? Anyway, you play as the purple Jersey Devil on his quest to take down the evil Dr. Narf and blow up all of his labs. You see, when Jersey Devil was a little purple baby, Dr. Narf wanted to dissect him. That didn't happen because, well, reasons. But now all you need to know is that Dr. Narf needs to die and his mutant plants are terrorizing the city so that makes you a would-be hero. 
Jersey Devil has quite a few abilities for you to use. In addition to standard running and jumping, he can also push and move certain objects. For your attack, you can punch or do a tail swipe if you attack in the air. You're constantly collecting pumpkins that are everywhere. But there are two more important things that you need to keep an eye out for. First are these green nitro boxes. If you get them all, you can blow up Dr. Narf's lab at the end of each mission. You don't need to get them all to continue on with the game though. What you do need to get are the letters that spell out Narf. Yep, another game that wants you to spell out a name. This was the hot new gameplay feature in the late 90s. Once you spell Narf's name, you can unlock a door somewhere and proceed. Some of these letters are right out in the open for you to grab. Others may require you to pull switches or resort to your wits to obtain. This game can often be a little bit cryptic. For example, at first I had absolutely no idea what I was supposed to do in this room with a rolling boulder. Turns out you're supposed to jump on the center thing a few times which will open it up and sink the rock. I mean, you can't really blame me, it doesn't really look like you're supposed to jump on it. Once again, I'm not as dumb as I look. Well, maybe I am, I don't know. Or how about this area where I found it difficult to collect all of the NARF letters mainly because everything looks the same and it was hard to tell where in the stage I was. So I just ended up running around aimlessly looking for that final letter which took longer than I would have liked. So how's the platforming? Honestly, for the most part, I really like it. There's a ton of crazy platforming here. Yes, yeah, sometimes it can be hard to judge depth, but you'll get it eventually. Fortunately, there are lots of extra lives laying around you can grab. The enemies often take multiple hits and collision doesn't seem to be in your favor, but you just need to learn when and where to hit them. These boxing spiders, they can go straight to hell though. Your worst enemy is by far the game's camera. It hates you. It tries to auto aim itself as you move around, but it's not very good at all. This game uses the dual shock, so naturally you want to use the R stick to adjust the camera, but no. This game is much too ancient for that idea. Instead, you can rotate it with the L2 and R2 buttons and it moves very slow. Also, the camera will sometimes angle itself in a way where it's hard to see an edge or where you can and can't land, resulting in quite a few deaths. It certainly doesn't help that Jersey Devil automatically jumps forward whenever he's near a ledge. And of course, when boulders chase you, the camera needs to show you running at the screen, giving you no time to react without dying a few times to learn where the gaps are. I wish that games would just stop trying to be Raiders of the Lost Ark. It works great in the movie, but not so much in a video game. Still, aside from these rather large flaws, the game is fun and it's easy to overlook said flaws. The graphics are plain, but I like that. The colors are nice and everything moves at a brisk frame rate. The music is Red Book Audio and it's very good, though it doesn't make me think of the devil or even New Jersey. If you want to play this one, make sure you have some patience as the camera will definitely mess with you. It is really worth putting up with it though. This one is also available for the PC by the way. Jersey Devil is everything I hate about platformers from that era, but I love it, so go figure. This next one is super obscure, especially to my American audience, which according to the analytics is about 49.4% of you. But I found this one pretty interesting, so let's check it out. This one is called Evil Twin, Cyprian's Chronicles, and it's available for the Dreamcast, PS2, and PC from Ubisoft and In Utero. What a weird name for a developer, In Utero. If I didn't know any better, I'd think it was headed up by Hideo Kojima. It just seems like a name he'd choose if he could. Anyway, this one was only ever released in the European region. I'm playing this on the Dreamcast just in case you didn't figure it out by the little video of me powering up my Dreamcast and taking the controller as if I was gonna play it only seconds ago. Does anyone remember that? It was a pretty cool if standard part of the video. But just in case you don't remember it, here it is again. Okay, we're all caught up. We know I'm playing the Dreamcast version, even though you didn't see me insert the disc. I mean, what's up with that? I usually insert the game, right? But this episode, I'm not doing it. Well, let's just never mind that. Let's get on with the game. Cyprian, or Sip for short, is an orphan who's being all grumpy. Then suddenly some magic or something whisks all of his friends away and even him. 
Now he's in a strange place looking for an object that of course has been scattered into many different pieces. Sip is a disgusting looking little kid, but whatever. He controls like most 3D platformers do, but he doesn't have much in the way of attacks. He can use a slingshot, which is his best move. He can also do a jump attack. Soon, you gain the ability to turn into Super Sip, but he needs to fill a gauge with icons in order to do this. Super Sip can jump higher and he has a stronger jumping attack. He can also charge ahead, which will bump enemies out of the way and even damage them. The control is a little iffy if you're trying to be precise, like getting onto these platforms. You never feel very safe doing it. Sometimes it feels like there's a bit of lag in the controls and you really want to overcompensate and end up falling to your doom. Most of the inhabitants in this strange world are split in half, but your hole and the guy who is helping you out is also whole, so you're called a two. That's T-O-O -O and not T-W-O. The platforming is generally pretty good and the camera doesn't fight you very much. You can rotate it with the L and the R triggers though. If you press them both at the same time, the game tries to recenter the camera directly behind you, which is nice. I did have one big issue with this game though. I played for about 45 minutes to get to this village. Not until you get here does it ever even prompt you to save your game. But it's not that simple, oh no. First, you've got to find a camera and then take it to that green guy who helps you out. So I'm running around this area looking for a damn camera so I can save my game, but I keep falling into these pits because I can't see them because of the camera angle. No matter what I tried, I kept getting knocked off into the abyss. I was forced to start over from the very beginning of the game. Seriously, let me save before I start losing all of my lives. Anyway, for some reason I felt compelled to play back up to this point. Fortunately, you can skip all of the dialogue, cutscenes, and most of the tutorial signs. So it only took me like maybe eight minutes to make it all the way back here. A huge thank you to the developers for making all of this stuff skippable. So many other developers could learn from this. But it turns out that grabbing a camera and then saving my game really isn't as stressful as I was making it out to be. There's some fetch quest stuff in the game and it doesn't really hold your hand terribly much, which I like. You need to figure out where to go and what to do. The graphics have a very grim and overcast feel, but otherwise are pretty good for their era. The frame rate isn't locked and it even hits 60 frames per second, sometimes. The music is really good and it definitely fits the dreary mood of the game. The voice acting isn't bad and there are even a few swear words here and there for the kids. But the voices are fairly compressed and sound slightly rough, at least on the Dreamcast version here. Oh, so now it's big, is it? And how big might it be? Not really a big deal in the grand scheme of things. The game as a whole is interesting, but I feel it could have used a little bit more time in development, even though this one was one of the last games released in the PAL region. I like the world here, and even the ugly characters kind of grow on you a bit. Check this one out if you can. Here's one that you don't hear, well, really anything about. Rough Trigger, the Vanocore conspiracy for the PlayStation 2 from Playstos and Natsumi. You play as Rough, a bounty hunter dog. Your boss and radio buddy send you on a mission to rescue these weird little puppy things called piglots as someone is paying big to get them back. Of course, on the way, there's lots of action and adventure in store for Rough. The gameplay reminds me a lot of Ratchet and Clank with maybe some of Jack and Daxter thrown in. Or is it Jack and Clank and Ratchet and Daxter? Anyway, you know, the main buddy platformer games on the Sony systems, but in this game, you're by yourself. Like those, there's a lot of stuff to collect here. Most of it is money to use in the shops. There's tons upon tons of breakable objects everywhere here, and most of it contains a bit of money. You can also collect ammo for the weapons you eventually get and life pellets to restore your life. There are also these tokens, and once you collect enough of them, your rank increases. This makes better stuff available at the shop. If you feel compelled to break every little thing in a stage, then you'll have way more money than you'll know what to do with in the shop. There's also an aspect that reminds me of Sega's Flicky. You need to carry a pig lot or get them to follow you to the blue teleport machine. This will also help you raise your rank. The good news is that some of these pig lots are practically invisible for no reason other than just to make them harder for you to find. Thanks, game. Even with that though, the game is fairly easy. 
though the controls could certainly use a bit of refinement. For example, to shoot with your gun, you need to hold R1. But in order to lock onto an enemy, you need to hold L1. I don't understand why I just can't hold R1 instead of needing to hold both. There are plenty of melee attacks you can do as well. Not long into the game, you get the ability to turn into a werewolf anytime you want. The werewolf can't shoot guns, but his melee attacks are stronger and he can jump a bit further. However, he is slightly tougher to control than normal rough. You can double jump in both modes. The stages are absolutely gigantic. They go on for quite a while. Honestly, it's not as bad as I make it sound as the game does a decent job of keeping things interesting. The motorcycle stage is a nice break for sure. There's not much room for error here though, so don't be surprised if you have to do this one a few times before you make it to the end. Graphically, this game is nothing special. It's not awesome, but it certainly isn't awful. It's dark, like a lot of PlayStation 2 games tend to be. The music can be good, but it gets repetitive mainly because the levels are so big. This was a budget-priced game, so I guess I should cut it a bit of slack. But even then, apparently next to no one wanted it, and even these days it's dirt cheap. Don't get me wrong, this game isn't bad, it just needs better pacing like some of the other games in this episode. So those were more obscure 3D platformers for you. I think I liked Pac-Man World 2 and Jersey Devil the best. Evil Twin wasn't bad either. Actually Pac-Man World 3 was good just simply because it's so bizarre. So do you guys have any examples of obscure 3D platformers you'd like to see me cover in the future that we didn't cover a year and a half ago and also weren't in this very episode? Seems silly to have to say that, but a few of you need to be told. Anyway, let me know in the meantime, thank you for watching GameSack.